Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Until the advent of X-rays, the only way to investigate a mummy was by dissection, as illustrated here by Margaret Murray in 1908. Although the existence of ancient Egyptian mummies had been recognised outside Egypt for many centuries, in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, there was an upsurge in interest in them. This followed Napoleon's incursions into Egypt in 1798. However, with the discovery of X-rays in 1895 by Wilhelm Konrad Röntgen, an alternative to the totally destructive procedure of mummy unwrapping and autopsy or dissection became available. The concept of non-invasive analysis was born. The initial x-rays were fairly basic and although contributing to our knowledge did have their limitations. As the decades rolled by developments in technology took place and in the late 1960s Godfrey Hounsfield developed the CAT or CT scanner with the first whole body scanner becoming available in 1975. Since then, the use of the CT, computerised tomography scanner, in mummy studies has been firmly established. In the case of Takabuti, she first underwent investigation in 1835 by being unwrapped, but fortunately not subjected to extensive and very destructive dissection. Plain x-rays were performed in 1987 and a CT scan in 2008. And it is those images of 2008 and their recent reanalysis that I shall discuss today. In this lecture, I want to consider the skeletal findings from the CT. Although soft tissues are imaged by a CT scan, the skeleton itself can provide a great wealth of information. For example, examination of various characteristics of the skeleton can inform about the sex, age at death, height, and provide evidence of illness and or injury in some cases. Mummification methods can also be explored, but this will be the subject of a separate lecture. So, to consider what Takabuti's skeleton can tell us, let's start by looking at the evidence leading to establish the sex of the individual. Obviously, this is easy when the perineum, the floor of the pelvis, is present, so revealing the primary sexual characteristics of either male or female genitalia. Unfortunately, in this case, the embalmers remove the perineum during the process of evisceration. The secondary sexual characteristics in the skeleton are therefore the only way we can determine the sex of the person found in Takabuti's coffin. Commencing at the head, it is possible to see that the area above the eye sockets, the supraorbital ridges, are not prominent. Also, the muscle markings on the bone, particularly at the back of the base of the skull, are not prominent. These features would support an identity of female. Moving now to the pelvis, the features indicate a female skeleton. Looking at the entrance to the pelvis, the pelvic brim, one can see that the shape is oval and wide, the characteristic of a female. Then, moving to the angle formed by the pubic bones, the subpubic angle, it is easy to see that this is about 100 degrees. This is also a female characteristic, being much narrower in a male. Finally, 
we come to the notch at the back of each side of the pelvis, the greater sciatic notch. The confirming feature of a female individual is the wide curve of this part of the pelvis as shown here. So having established that the mummy is that of a female, we can consider age at death. This is frequently easier in sub-adults, that is children, because the appearance and subsequent fusion of growth plates in long bones and the eruption of teeth can give a fairly accurate picture of the age of the individual. In the case of adults, one has to rely on closure of certain elements of the skeleton, as well as tooth wear and the appearance of degenerative disease, for example, arthritis. Examination of the teeth indicates that they are all erupted, thus indicating an adult. However, there is little wear of the crowns, indicating a young adult. This is further confirmed by the absence of dental pathology, except for a carious cavity in the left upper wisdom tooth. There is no tooth loss, a common feature seen in many adult mummies from ancient Egypt. The only other dental abnormality is the presence of a supplemental incisor in the lower jaw, an extra tooth. This is a rare congenital abnormality found in only approximately 0.02% of the modern population. However, you have already heard of these abnormalities earlier. Looking at the rest of the skeleton reveals that all the growth plates are fused, but there is no evidence of degenerative joint disease. This again indicates that this is the body of a young adult. More sophisticated observations, such as the fusion of certain elements of the sacrum, again indicate that this is the body of a young adult. It is also possible to measure the height of the individual reasonably accurately by a direct method using electric calipers, a tool embedded in the DICOM Reader software. This can be used, as I say, for direct measurement of the height, or to measure the length of various long bones so that the height can be calculated using accepted tables. At this point, it is helpful to emphasise that CT scans do not contain any element of magnification, such as is encountered in plain x-rays. Moving now to the subject of pathology, that is, disease or congenital abnormality. The first thing that becomes apparent is that the sacrum, normally formed by the fusion of five independent vertebral elements, exhibits a lack of fusion of the upper element. We call this lumbarization of S1. It is found in about 2% of people, but rarely causes any symptoms, perhaps some backache. So, we can now move to the most spectacular finding in the skeleton of Takabuti. This is the damage to the back of the left side of the chest. Initial observations of the axial or transverse images and then the coronal images, as you can see here, reveals that there is damage to the second to sixth ribs inclusive, with loss of substance in the central three ribs. This would indicate that the force of the injuring blow was greater in the central area of the injury. The interpretation of this is that the edge of the weapon had a convex curve. Referring to weapons available at that time of Egyptian history suggests that this may have been an axe. So, we have evidence of a penetrating wound to the back of the left upper chest. The major blood vessels in this area 
would almost certainly have been damaged as a result of the penetration, and this would have resulted in catastrophic bleeding leading to death. Other damage to the skeleton is in the region of the lower lumbar spine, where the procedure in 1835 resulted in complete division of the body, and, after re-wrapping, a gap of some 2.5 centimetres between adjacent elements of the spine. Finally, the left hand exhibits evidence of damage. This is in the form of separation of the fingers from the bones of the palm, the metacarpals, as seen here. There is also loss of some of the individual finger bones, the phalanges. At one time, this damage was assumed to have taken place during the unwrapping in 1835, a very reasonable assumption. However, a closer look at the packing material in the thorax, the chest, shows that two of those phalanges are to be found deep within this packing material. The obvious conclusion is that the hand was damaged during mummification and the detached bones were replaced within the body during packing the body cavity with that sawdust resin mixture. Why the hand disintegrated in this way is a mystery, but clearly it was either damaged or more prone to putrefaction than the remainder of the body for some reason. The next feature of the skeleton to help us in Takabuti's case is the opportunity it gave us to collect very small samples for other investigations. We were able to identify several areas of the body which would yield very small samples of tissue to be used in laboratory analyses, such as ancient DNA genomics, chemical analysis of the resin around the neck, analysis of the packing material within the trunk, and finally, ultramodern analysis of the protein structure of the muscles at the back of the thigh. All these other analyses are the subject of other lectures, and so I will not say any more about them. However, one of the groundbreaking methods that was used was the harvesting of these samples by a minimally invasive technique. This was achieved by using a very fine bone marrow biopsy needle with an external diameter of only 3 millimetres. With entry through the inner layers of the bandaging, exposed by retraction of the superficial layers, and only using two entry points, it was possible to retrieve all the samples needed with minimal damage to the mummy, and in a manner hidden from view. This was possible by planning the procedure beforehand using the CT scans, and guiding the needle plus confirming the position of its tip by using an X-ray image intensifier. This also gave the opportunity to record the sites of sampling for future reference. Modern technology enabled all of the sampling to be performed in the Egyptian gallery of the Ulster Museum. So reducing the chances of damage which may have occurred during transport from one site to another. One final point to mention about this technique is the ability to take samples from deep within the body, so eliminating the possibility of contamination from procedures in the last couple of centuries, including that in October 2018. So, in conclusion, the examination of Takabuti's skeleton in the CT scans has given many items of information and enabled the sampling of tissue to allow very modern scientific techniques to be applied to her. Thank you very much for your attention.